Hello, guys. I uh, apologize that the Chapter 7 lecture did not stream to you guys. Um, I tried to record it <clears throat> when I did it live today, but it did not record it for some reason. It recorded like 15 minutes and cut off. Um, so we're going to give this one a shot. Um, so today's all about autism, uh, what autism is, what you can expect from it. Um, a goal of mine in this lecture is to kind of break down what your preconceived notions are of autism and show you that there's so many different levels. Um, you know, that it's a broad spectrum disorder that can encompass a lot of different aspects from being very mild to something being very severe. Um, autism spectrum disorder, we'll often refer to it as ASD. Um, it's a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, this includes difficulties with social communication and interaction deficits, as well as different repetitive patterns of behavior and interests. Um, this is going to affect how an individual understands and engages in the world. Um, if your social communication and interaction skills are off, that's going to really affect how you live every bit of your daily life. Um, it is a brain-based condition. Um, often with early onset in um, early childhood. Um, we have this, what's called neurodiversity movement. Um, before roughly the year 2000, there was more of a focus in fixing or eliminating um, autism. And we have moved away from that in a pretty drastic manner. Um, we are more along the lines of let's include these people, let's advocate for them, let's figure out how they're thinking, how do they fit into this world, um, you know, and that's kind of what occupational therapy is all about is finding people that has a disability or some type of illness um, and teaching them how to interact in the world, how to, you know, go about and have good quality of life. Um, this neurodiversity movement really shaped policy. Um, research different parent organizations. Um, there's lots of things that were um, branched out of this movement. Um, but the big thing to remember here is that it was it was taking into account or, or rejecting the idea of fixing autism or eliminating it, but more of inclusion and advocacy for these people. Um, so shifting some conceptualizations, uh, we've all heard in our various psychology classes um, about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, the DSM. We're on the fifth edition now. Um, this is what helps give you the diagnosis or the criteria in order to gain a diagnosis um, across mental health. Um, one outlier here that has gone back and forth in autism spectrum disorder is um, Asperger syndrome. It is currently listed as part of um, ASD. It's such an umbrella term, it fits underneath there. It's very mild um, autism, very high functioning. Um, there's five criteria when it comes to diagnosing. Among those five criteria, two of them are very symptom specific. So you need to know these for your exams. Um, the first one is social communication and social interaction impairments. The second one is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. So restrictive repetitive, repetitive patterns are going to be something, it means it affects how they're going to go about their daily life. And then the social communication, social interaction impairments, we'll talk a little bit about that now. The interaction deficits, this includes difficulty making and keeping friends or satisfying a helpful social network. Um, they're going to have difficulty in participating in back and forth conversation. Um, that can be very hard to build relationships if you're unable to do that. Um, and that ties into the social communication deficits. Um, these can also be verbal and nonverbal. So it could be difficulty actually speaking and telling, or it could be difficulty just keeping eye contact um, uh, or giving gestures. Um, I cannot play these videos and let them, they, they just don't work with the volume. Um, these videos are uploaded on your eLearn with these exact names. Uh, this is a Colale. I always say that wrong. I probably did that some too. But what it is, it is a meaningless repetition of another person's speech. When you watch this video, you will actually see her, you know, he'll give her an instruction and she'll repeat it back to him. There's no purposefulness for this. Um, this kind of a behavior 
is actually normal in the 18 month to three year old range. Um, but in um, children that have autism, the, it lasts longer, uh, not necessarily forever, but it does last longer. Now, I'm not sitting here saying, you know, if it happens for three years and two months that, you know, a child is autistic. That's not what I'm saying. But in general, 18 months to three years old is what um, it, it is normal for this kind of a behavior. So go ahead and pause this lecture. Go into eLearn. Click um, the Akolale video and watch it and see. And then we'll come back here and discuss. OK, so you watched the video, you saw that she was getting information from him, getting an instruction for him and giving him the exact saying the exact same thing back to him. That is what that is. Um, this example is immediate at LA, but there's also delayed, uh, meaning they can be saying things later, 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 or you give it to them. And then an hour later, they just keep saying it over and over and over. Um, so those are the two different types. If you guys have any questions on that, feel free to email me and let me know. Um, so what are some of the criteria? Um, you have what's called stereotyping. That is defined as just any kind of repetitive act. Um, and people with autism, it is not a functional, functional kind of movement. Um, it can be verbal or it could be a behavior. Um, it can be very unrelated to the context when they're speaking. Um, this is where you see the hand flapping, finger waving, uh, rocking, repetitive vocalizations, um, you know, those kind of things is stereotypy behaviors. But what you need to keep in mind is what seems not functional to us does actually have a function for them where it might not be accepted as this is a functional behavior. It is something that helps keep them calm. It is something that is they're they're getting so much information at once. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit, but it's something that helps kind of keep them, you know, under wraps. It's um, it's their tick. It's what's the it's what they want. Um, it's it's a calming method, more or less. Um, people with ASD have a lot of sensory deficits, um, again, depending on their severity. Um, they can be fascinated with certain things like lights and sounds or pictures, things that, you know, somebody that doesn't have ASD would just walk right by, not even pay any attention to, um, you know, that it was just nothing like a shiny pair of shoes or whatnot. You know, that might be something that really catches their attention, whereas we would just walk by and it really wouldn't do anything for us. Um, they can experience very overwhelming um, sensory input, especially in social groups, big areas. I have a video you guys are going to watch here in just a little bit about, um, you know, a child with ASD, what it looks like and feels like to him when he's walking through a mall with his mom, what other people look like uh, or what other people see him as. Um, there is also some criteria and stuff that are listed on um, table 7-2 in your book. Check it out for some different um, intervention, stuff like that, symptoms. It's just a good helpful table. It'd be good for your knowledge to look at it. Um, lastly, you have sensory modulation dysfunction. Um, this is difficulty filtering and adjusting to sensory events in order to engage in activities. Um, this is, you're going to see that a lot better in the video. They're unable to filter out what's important, what's not. They're just getting all this information and they can't really filter it out. Um, so etiology, um, I went over this in the live lecture that etiology means the cause. You're going to see this in all of my lectures um, that what is the cause um, of these illnesses? You're going to hear me a lot of the time say, well, there's not one cause. There's nothing that's just, you know, this is the cause. So far, we don't know of one single cause for autism. Um, we do think that there's a strong genetic link, but that's still emerging um, research areas. Um, the largest study that's ever been done said about 50% they believe was actually heritable cases of uh, autism that they gained it from genetics. Um, but there's no singular genetic difference that's associated with autism. It involves over approximately a thousand different genes um, when they're looking in the study. So it's really hard to say, point out and say, this is it. Um, I spoke to Charleston a lot about, um, you know, the fact that this could be 
a big cause of why we have so many conspiracy theories surrounding autism and what causes it and all this other stuff because we, you know, we don't know. Science is not telling us that, you know, some of these conspiracy theories are right, but what they are saying is we don't know exactly what causes it yet, and it makes it a dangerous ground when you're having conversations um, because autism affects a lot of people. And we're going to go over that in just a minute, exactly how many. Um, there's a neurobiological factor, too, that the, ba- uh, that the brain is based um, – it's different from infancy all the way up through. So the, their brain chemistry and things are a little bit different. Um, deficits and behaviors associated with autism are often found with um, differences in brain connectivity. So there's just the connections, the anatomy of the brain, the makeup, and the function of the brain. Um, differences in those categories is what makes somebody have either very mild or severe autism. That's what makes the big difference. Um, as far as connections go, there's two things that we need to mention called an overconnectivity. connectivity have too many connections. So much stuff is coming in. They don't really know how to filter it. It's just so much all at one time. And then underconnectivity is they don't have um, a lot of connections. Now, some people can start in overconnectivity connectivity in like an infant and toddler, and then they'll actually shift to underconnectivity between two and four years of age. It's just because the brain is not developing at that normal rate, at that normal timing that normal way um and that can lead to a whole bunch of different issues so just how prevalent is autism in the united states these numbers are actually um from 2014 they're the numbers that are in your book so i listed them on the slides but they i do have updated numbers um according to the cdc it is 5,437,988 individuals in the united states are currently living with asd and then instead of being one in 68 children are on the spectrum, it is now estimated that one in 40 children um, are on the spectrum. That is also from the CDC's website. Um, it's not considered a rare disorder at all. Um, there's been a huge significant increase since the 90s, um, and this can be from a lot of different things, um, whether it be like public awareness or different diagnostic approaches or recognizing you know, that it is such a massive umbrella of a disorder that a lot more people fall under that. Um, One thing that's extremely important to remember here is that it's not an epidemic. Um, Epidemics are associated with biological threats to life. I think we've heard enough about epidemics over this past year with COVID. Um, So don't put those two together. You know, it's not an epidemic. Um, We are working very hard in our profession to remove that idea that, um, Autism is an epidemic. Don't even put it in the discussion when you talk about autism. Um, As OT practitioners, you would never say that it is an epidemic. So what is the course like for somebody that has uh, autism? There's no one specific course. It really depends on onset patterns. Um, It is a lifelong condition. It depends on how severe that it is. Um, early diagnosis is actually pretty hard to do, but it's very important in order to have early intervention for improved outcomes. Um, throughout all of your courses, we'll say the earlier that a client gets intervention, normally the better the outcome. Um, parents are usually the first people to detect uh, a developmental difference. Um, you know, it comes a lot of times from parent concerns, say, you know, so-and-so is doing this, but my child is not. It comes from comparisons. Um, you know, that's normally first person. Babysitters see it. Teachers can see it. Um, the average age of diagnosis is around five years old. Um, you know, some get caught earlier, some get caught later, but general speaking, um, five is the age of normal diagnosis. Um You'll see a later diagnosis if there's no intellectual disability, which is our chapter eight lecture next week. Um, a quicker diagnosis for autism, it, you, you will gain that if there's an intellectual disability present. So you don't have to have an intellectual disability if you have autism. In fact, the majority do not um, also have an intellectual disability, but it's easier to diagnose both autism and intellectual disabilities if they're both present in the same person. Um, so after somebody gains a diagnosis, the severity of symptoms, um, how, how bad that they get, does not always mean difficulty when adapting to function. So just because somebody is having a little bit harder time or, you know, they have those more 
verbalizing behaviors or you know outward behaviors does not always mean they have a harder time adapting to function you have to go to each person individually um children with severe symptoms often and can make very notice noticeable progress um you know we still will say that outcomes are are on the poor range when it comes to autism that's just because early intervention is not caught up as much as what we would like it to be it's still emerging we're working very hard to do so it's just kind of hard to get everybody on board at the same time um let's see they also have a higher prevalency of epilepsy or seizures um, and a higher mortality rate um let me go back a slide there you go more stress and depression symptoms um, can be not only for the client but also for the caregiver that is such an Im important part of ot is understanding that the parent or the caregiver whoever it may be is going through so much stress um you know there is a really good resource it's a book on amazon called stretched but not broken it is amazing it has a rubber band on the front that'll let you know you've got the right one um, it's a book about caregiver burnout um, you have to think that these people you know a lot of times we're expecting normal life normal parenthood stuff like that and then there's a lot that's not going to be in severe cases um, so they're struggling and they're a lot of times they have depression and a lot of times they're very very stressed out and worried they just don't know what they're going to do they have a lot of anxiety it is our job as ot practitioners to help bring them back show them that there's this way show them and find them help that is what we have to do now it's not your job to go in there and, and fix everything but it is your job to know all of the resources that are out there for these patients um you know it can be very costly there's a lot that goes into treatment with autism so you have to keep in mind these caregivers are stressed out to the max um, but you're there to help be the voice of reason you're the one to know the resources you're the ones there for the treatment interventions um, now we'll go into some gender differences again if you guys have any questions at all in this lecture i know i'm going kind of fast it's harder for me to slow down i don't have anybody in front of me talking i'm just talking to a computer screen so if you come up with questions, let me know, okay? Um, autism is more common in males than it is for females. Um, however, females are more likely to be on the spectrum and have an intellectual disability. Um, so males are more often to just have ASD, but to have ASD and an ID, um, females have a higher rate of that, not by a lot, it's about 36% of females that have ASD have an intellectual disability. And then about 30% of males with ASD also have an intellectual disability. Um, so I hope that makes sense for you. Um, some cultural specific things. Um, it's higher prevalence in Caucasian children. Um, we talked a little about a little bit about this in Charleston today that um, you know it, that could be for a lot of different things from socioeconomic statuses to you know just stereotypes there's a lot of things that go into that why that would have a higher prevalence um just because of diagnosing children that are hispanic often get diagnosed later statistically um speaking might, probably because of resources would be the biggest one children from lower lower socioeconomic statuses are often diagnosed later uh, but good news that gap is closing this is with more outreaches this is with more understanding in the community of how important early intervention is um, i can't stress to you enough how important this next little bullet point is that it affects every area um, when it comes to occupation we break down our treatments into these areas and these are very important for you to write down and know you have adls which is like your dressing your bathing your toileting stuff like that then you have IADLs. Those are instrumental activities of daily living. So ADLs is activities of daily living. IADLs is instrumental activities of daily living. This is the cooking, the laundry, the taking care of the dog. You know, these things are very important for you to have a good quality of life. They fall into that category. One that gets tripped up a lot is self-feeding. Self-feeding, the actual act of moving the food from the plate to your mouth, that's an ADL cooking and meal prepping that's IADLs um next is the rest and sleep you know we can come up with wake cycles and um, 
stuff like that to help people if they are somebody who does better in the evening um you know even scheduling naps working out that daily schedule with the client that goes a long way and fits right in with ot um education as far as you know example be working in the school systems um saying hey you know this this client does way better in a quiet room you know maybe this is something we need to look at or you know these posters are very visually stimulating for some for this client that has asd uh, maybe we should tone this down a little bit you know stuff like that or even all the way down to some um, you can talk about fine motor stuff with that with you know handwriting um work you know talking to a employer about reasonable accommodations um you know that's a big one saying you know this person you know there's a big flickering light up here can we get that changed because it's very distracting you'll get more productivity stuff like that um that's all in our scope play and leisure play is normally used more with uh, in pediatrics leisure is used a lot more with um adults geriatrics it's interchangeable but it um you know in, in general the, uh, that's how it's going to be set up uh, so like your hobbies uh whatever you enjoy doing you know those kind of things is normally the play and leisure and then lastly social participation that's any kind of group that you know or event whatever that we fall right into all those categories all right so intelligence and executive functioning so about 31 percent of individuals meet the criteria for an intellectual disability that have asd um not all in fact you know, 69%, the majority don't actually have a, uh, an ID that has ASD. Um, that is actually met that criteria when someone's IQ is 70 or lower. Um, but, you know, the, the standard IQ test can be very, you know, it's, it, it's underestimating the complexity of intelligence in a lot of cases. Um, I, Personally, I, I'm not a big advocate for the IQ, but it's not the only predictor for having an ID. Um, it's just one that they use a lot. Um, oh, OT utilizes often, um, or, or we're used often to, you know, work with employers, with friends and family members to assist in um, reducing like unexpected changes, uh, developing routines. Um, this idea of executive functioning, though. Uh, it's responsible for, you know, your higher level thinking, your problem solving skills, stuff like that. There's no major differences between somebody with autism that's like this is what's different in executive functioning. Um, but they often have deficits in flexibility and planning. Um, so that's a little bit that is kind of across the board, but there's nothing that's like this is different with executive functioning. Some behavioral difficulties. Um, you know, sensory processing is is huge with um, ASD. Uh, you can experience behaviors from aggression, destruction, disruption, running away, self injury. You know, I had um, a question from Charleston. You know, like with the self injury portion, you have to get out of the mouth. Like, if a child is going to hurt themselves or whatever, and you're there, you have to stop the child from doing that. Now, I'm not saying be aggressive and all this other stuff, but you know, if, if a child with ASD is doing some self-stem stuff and it's dangerous and they're having this self-injury kind of thing, you don't want them to, like, you know, stab themselves with a pencil or someone else or throw things and hurt somebody. You can't let that behavior happen. Um, so it's not that you can't put your hands on it. I know everybody's scared about that, but it's not you can't put your hands on it. You're stopping a harmful behavior from self-harm. It's a, it's a big difference. Um the the sensory processing aspect of it if you have difficulty with that it can make things like nail trimming teeth brushing hair brushing haircuts all very very difficult um one good intervention for that would be changing the environment or slowly introducing something rather than trying to do the whole task at once um, we're going to talk a lot more about interventions as we go on and there's several good um videos there's there's a lot of research out there about autism and OT. So, you know, do a little bit of self-research, look on YouTube, find some good interventions. Um, this is a really great video. Um, so after I'm done talking here, go ahead and pause the video for the lecture, go on to YouTube and watch that. It's also listed on your e-learn. Um, this is what it looks like for a child that is autistic, that is going through a mall with his mother or his caregiver. 
Um, it shows you what it looks like in their eyes, why it's so overstimulating, why they have these breakdowns, um, and how it can be so difficult for a child to, to take in all this information. Um, it also shows you a good aspect of how the mother may be feeling, as well as saying how the <clears throat> general population sees a child that is autistic that's having a breakdown in the middle of this mall. You know, they're, they're being looked at like they're weird, that the parent is a bad parent. Um, I think it's an eye-opening video. So go ahead and pause this video, watch that. Um, and if you have any questions on it, feel free to give me a shout back. Uh, but then come back here and we'll continue with the lecture. Okay, some different interventions and medications. There's a really good table on page 111 in your books, 7-4. Those are a lot of common interventions used for autism, from very mild to severe. Um, medication is most effective uh, when it's provided on a very individualized basis. There's no autism medicine. There's nothing like this is it. You'll hear a lot about Risperdal, um, some ADHD medications, but a lot of these have some significant side effects. Um, but there's nothing that really treats the core features of autism. It's just, you know, trying to help manage some symptoms, um, but there's no broad. So if you can ask them an exam that says, you know, what's the medication that they use for autism, you would say none of the above. Okay. Or if Risperdal is on there, it's the most commonly used. All right, lastly, I think this is a good picture to help sum it up a little bit. I've got this in one more video. Um, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, it's so important to remember that each person is, that is dealing with ASD is going to deal with it on an individualized basis. Same thing with any other treatment. We're very holistic in our treatment methods. We're treating the patient, not the disorder. So make sure when you take into account um, e even, you know, clients that have ASD that you don't know what you're walking into, you don't know what they're dealing with, and you don't know what's important to them. So make sure that you are taking this approach with occupational therapy in your different treatment interventions. Lastly, um, there's one more video for you to watch. This lecture was pretty short because I used a lot of videos. Um, it's about 20 minutes long. It's on your e-learn. It's called the Temple Grandin TED Talk. She has her doctorate degree. Um, she's currently a professor. She has high-functioning autism. She is an amazing, amazing woman. She will blow you away. Um, don't want to ruin it for you. There's just so much good information in that video. Feel free to send me a message. Let me know how you felt about that video. Um, but anyway, go ahead and pause that and then come back. Okay, I hope that that video really spoke to you, made you open your eyes to what somebody with high-functioning autism can be. She's such a strong advocate for the disorder. Um, you know, I even actually emailed her and asked her if she would do a guest lecture. I never heard anything back. She's a very busy woman, but um, she just she's a very inspirational person. Um, you do have a homework assignment. Um, the movie that she mentioned in the TED Talk is about an hour and 45, hour and 55 minutes. Um, there's a link on your e-learn, the same place all the other videos have been, for you to watch that video for free through the UC library. Um, you do have, there's not a written portion of this. If I feel like you didn't uh, watch it, you know, there will be a written portion to it, but um, watch that video. We're going to have a good in-class discussion on Tuesday before we lecture Chapter 8 on what, um, what you thought about it. Um, it'll show you exactly her, literally her entire life's work and how it made such a difference. Um, if you guys have any questions at all about 208 or in general, shoot me a message, let me know. Um, watch this video, make sure you watch all the videos that I talked about in the lecture. Um, take good notes because this is exactly where your test questions come from, this and reading the chapter. Uh, make sure you read chapter eight and chapter nine um, in preparation for class next week. And uh, again, if you need anything at all, please give us a shout. Thanks. Bye-bye.